is that hour of the day when we look at things pertaining to the word of the Lord, where he says, tell my people to return to me. It's our daily broadcast on the state of the union, the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And he has said to me, go and tell my people to return to me. Now, how did it come about that? From time to time, I've chosen to repeat the story because I do appreciate that not everyone present today would have been there at the other times when I've said it. So I do acknowledge that some people might be joining us for the first time. And if that's your case, I can only encourage that you go back and uh, visit the recorded versions of this series of broadcasts. You will be greatly blessed. And perhaps you too might find a reason in some area in your Christian experience where you might have deviated from the position of the Lord. So on that day, Christmas Day of 2021, I went to wish him happy birthday that I normally do, I've done for several years now. On Christmas Day, whenever I do wake up, one of the first things I do besides waking up, that is, I go to him in the privacy of my inner chamber, if you know what I mean, in my closet. I go to him and I say, Lord, happy birthday. Now, this is not about whether he was born on December 25th or not. It's the fact that he was born. He was born into this earth. And I have agreed to choose that day to recognize the fact that he was born. So I go to him and I say, happy birthday. Now, on this occasion, Christmas of 2021, I went to him. I said, Lord, happy birthday. No response. That, was, that, that, that threw me off my stride. Lord, I said happy birthday. Why are you not answering me? Is there something wrong? No response. About four times I did that, and each time he acted like he wasn't there. Now, I don't need to wonder whether he's there or not. I, I, I know very most certainly that he's there. Let's not begin to talk about how I know the presence of God. He already promised I will never leave you or forsake you, so I know he's there. But that aside, so I said, Lord, why are you not responding? And he said, I'm not happy. And then he, he, he washed my face. He, he opened my eyes so I could see him. And I saw a man, or I saw the face like onto a man. And he looked, um, as we would say in English, lost in thought, far away in thought. Certainly he wasn't, he was there physically, so to say, but he wasn't with me. His mind was far away. So I said, Lord, what's going on? You seem far away in thought. And he said, I'm not happy. And I said, Lord, is it something that I've done? He said, no, it's not about you. I said, so Lord, what's the problem? And he said, the people for whom I died don't seem to appreciate the fact. In fact, even the ones that are in the church act as if I'm not there. They act as if I'm not relevant. They don't bother with me. I'm not happy. Lord, what can I do about this? That's when he responded with the words, go and tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. I want you to start from today. Now, as it turned out, he had been talking to me about this series of broadcasts. I just didn't know when it was going to start or what was going to be the content. So when he said it that day, I, I understood that, okay, this is what you've been talking about. And so we've been at it. And today's March the night, every day, exploring one or the other, different aspects, different dimensions of how we might have walked away from him, necessitating his sending me, and I'm sure several others around me. By the way, I have an audience here with me, and. Uh, in the audience, I have a certain gentleman who has also received that commission two years ago. In fact, he has written a book on the subject, Return to the Lord. So I'm not the only one who has received this type of message. Go and tell my people to return to me. So that's what we are about. So yesterday, we began by looking at a piece of scripture from Galatians chapter 3, where the apostle said, well, asked a question really, and then 
proceeded from several other parts of the Bible to deal with the matter that he had asked a question about. Galatians chapter 3 verse 1, he said, All foolish Galatians who has bewitched you, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Then he proceeded to express the same, essentially the same sentiment in Colossians chapter 2. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holiday or an of a new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of the reward in voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he had not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now I say that he continued the same sentiment. First he said in Galatians chapter 3, who has bewitched you? Now in Colossians 2.18, he uses a different word. He says, let no man beguile you. So there is a business that borders on Christianity where you can be bewitched or beguiled. And in other places, different words are used. But it comes down to the same principle. Somebody besides God and perhaps even your own self wanting to turn you away from the way of truth that is in Christ. Now, if you, if you pay a visit to Acts chapter 13, you will see when they spoke about the sorcerer by Jesus, he says that he wanted to stop the deputy from receiving the faith. He said he, he wanted to turn him from the faith. Everything that sorcerer was doing in that palace or in that, in that exalted place, the place of the deputy, everything that sorcerer was doing was aimed at just one thing, to turn him from the faith, to prevent him from hearing and responding to whatever the apostles had to say. Now the formula hasn't changed, or the tactic hasn't changed. The other day we used the word disinformation. It's a strategy of war. It presents you with false information with the intent to deceive. So here again is another word, deception. So we have to bewitch, we have to beguile. Now I've said be weak to, to, to deceive. Now there are other words I have used. I used yesterday I mentioned the word subterfuge. Subterfuge. We also have words like seduction. We have words like subtlety. You know, over in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says that the serpent was more subtle than any other beast in the field. So it was by subtlety that he beguiled or captured or captivated or enchanted or bewitched or attracted and fascinated the mind of Eve to the point that she lost consciousness of what God had said to them. And he started in that occasion by asking her a question, a suggestive question. Has God said you will not die? Did God really say you won't die? Now let me paraphrase the, the serpent at that time. Has God really said you will not die? Because I know that it is not that you will not die. It's just that God does not want you to be like him. Yet, God had said to man, the day you eat of the fruit of that tree, you will surely die. Why are you asking me questions about what I know to be the word of God? And I try to avoid the temptation of giving examples of today, yesterday. I, I, I deliberately chose not to get into that business. But it has come up again. So some will ask, oh, in fact, I remember when I just became a Christian long ago now, I had said to an uncle of mine that I had become a Christian. And you know what he asked me? He said, so now you'll be carrying your money to go and be given to a pastor in the name of tithe. Uncle, is that all that you see about Christianity to ask me? Now, these are they which captivate and capture 
by some of the things that they present to us. Now, we dealt with much of this yesterday, so we take today as part two of what we started yesterday in the business of who has bewitched you. Who has so captivated and captured and, and entrailed you to the point you have lost control of your own decision making? Somebody or someone or some topic or some idea that has so attracted or interested you to the point that you no longer have power to influence what you do. You now operate based on what they say. And you don't even know what's going on. James chapter 1, he said, the sin comes after we have first been what? Drawn away. So there is need, there's, there's, there, there needs to be first a drawing away. The person who is drawing you away from Christ is not going to tell you that he's drawing you away from Christ. The person that Paul spoke about in Acts chapter 20, where he says that among you, ravenous wolves will appear. And their purpose will be to draw a followership to themselves. Those guys are not going to announce from the pulpit in the church, hey, gentlemen or, or ladies, I want to take some of you as my personal disciples away from Jesus. Nobody ever makes such an announcement. But I always say, if you listen carefully, you will know that these people don't represent Jesus, but they represent themselves. But that's not my immediate business for today. My business for today is the question that we asked and tried to answer yesterday. Who has bewitched you? Who has enchanted you to the point it seems like a spell has been cast over you that you can't think for yourself anymore? You can't read the Bible and just believe what's written there. You need somebody to, 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 to interpret, to give you their own understanding of what is written, as if you cannot read. So the apostle asked, who has bewitched you? Having started by the Spirit, you are now trying to fulfill the expectations of Christianity by the flesh. Having started by believing the word of God that was preached to you, now you are having to operate by reasoning, by using such a strong word, bewitch. So because of that, we have to look at different understandings of the word bewitch yesterday. And I can only encourage you so that I'm continuing to repeat myself. Go back to yesterday's rendition of this broadcast and help yourself. But we must move on from what we did yesterday. Because I want to bring the matter closer home today and make it a bit more personal. By asking a couple of questions. Who have you been listening to? Really? Who have you been listening to? At the very outset of this broadcast, I, I used the example of a certain gentleman, pastor, preaching in the church. Matthew, this is church business. I'm talking to church people. We are church folk. And the fellow is giving a testimony of how he entered the country to which he had been posted to go and start a church. And he said, when he got to the port of entry, as he came down from the plane, he noticed a queue. And the immigration officials were asking all the people one by one in front of him, how long are you staying? What's your business here? And he began to think to himself, how long am I staying? If I tell them two years, they will ask me what, I, what I've come to do for which I need to be in the country for two years. And then if I tell them that I came to start a church, they probably might not, I may not, I may not be welcome here. Now, while he was ruminating over this, an idea popped up in his mind, saying, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he replied the thought, what has that got to do with immigration asking me questions now? And the thought proceeded to meditate itself for him, saying, if the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, and by inheritance of the Lord, you are now co-heirs with Jesus, so whatever belongs to Jesus now belongs to you. If the earth belongs to the Lord, then the earth also belongs to you. He says, so what of it? What of it if the earth belongs to me? I have to answer these immigration people their questions. And then the thought, you see, I'm saying the thought, I don't want to say the speaker, because he didn't present it like a speaker. He thought he was thinking, or he thought he was talking. So he said the thought now proceeded to say to him, if the earth belongs to you by reason of inheritance, and you are coming to any country in the earth, it means that you are coming home. Why should anybody be asking you how long you are going to stay at home? 
And then wisdom came to him. He got the point. And so when he got to his turn, the immigration officer actually asked him the question, how long are you staying? And rather incredulously, he looked at the immigration fellow and asked him a similar question, or a question of his own. How can you ask me how long I'm going to stay at home? When you get home, does your wife ask you how long you're going to be home? And the immigration man looked at him, what do you mean? He said, I've come home. This country is home to me. I've come home and you're asking me how long I'm going to stay at home. Why should you be asking me such a question? The immigration man looked at him and laughed and said, you people, you have come again. I'm not going to mention the name of the man's country. He said, you people have come again. He took his passport and gave him two years entry visa, which was what he needed. Now we were in church. He's giving a testimony. And then he said, and spoiled everything that he had said before. He said, this is why we tell you people to dig deep and find nuggets of the word of God for yourself. If I had not been digging deep, that nugget of gold in the word of God would not have helped me solve that problem that day. Now, the moment I heard that, I gathered my things, my Bible, my notepad, I gathered everything and I was going to leave the church. And the Holy Spirit said to me, no, don't leave. If you leave, people will notice and they will begin to wonder why you left and that will be a distraction to them. So I sat back down and, and let him finish. But my angst was simply this. Are you going to tell me you do not know that it was the Holy Spirit who just gave you the way out? What is so difficult about saying the Holy Spirit gave me wisdom? The Holy Spirit gave me insight. You are saying it is because you read Bible. It is because you dig deep. That's why you were able to walk that solution. That's not correct. Now many people sat down that day, heard what he said, perhaps would have gone away thinking, oh, I got to go and dig deep. I got to read the Bible. Now there's nothing wrong with reading the Bible. But like I said yesterday, Jesus said in John chapter 5, 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they that testify of me. And you won't come to me that you might have eternal life. The crux of the matter is about Jesus. Or if you like today, the Holy Ghost. Since as we say, Jesus is in heaven. The Holy Ghost is here in the person of Jesus, in the place of Jesus. So, as it were, Jesus, in the person of the Holy Spirit, simply gave the fellow a way out of his immediate problem. And then he gives the glory to himself. That's why I wanted to leave. So who have you been listening to? Because if you are not careful, you will listen to that type of testimony and you will say, oh, this is a mighty man of God, he reads the Bible. But he just took the glory from God. Now, this is how they, with subtlety, draw fellowship, followership to themselves. Making themselves look like some great man of God. And we don't know when it happens. Over in Acts chapter 8, it, it says there that Simon the sorcerer bewitched a whole city by sorcery to the point that they gave to him they, they, they began to hail him as some great man of God until Philip came so back to my original question who have you been listening to because when Paul asked the question who has bewitched you I don't necessarily think that he was talking about occultic type of witchcraft in itself Although I recognize that Acts chapter 8 says that the man bewitched them by sorcery, so it is possible. But you see, a lot of the time, it is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be occultic type of sorcery, you know, the original witchcraft. It doesn't have to be that. It can just be by sweet words. It can just be by turning, turning the arrow a little bit to face yourself so it looks like you are the champion. You are the one who healed the man. You say, oh, we just prayed a little prayer and the man was healed. Is that so? You just prayed a little prayer and the man was healed? Is that what really happened? Why can't we bring Jesus into the picture? I prayed that Jesus healed him. Why can't we say it like that? I say it's easy to know. If you know what to look at or listen to, you will know. Who have you been listening to? Next question. What have you been listening to? What have you been listening to? Where do you get your opinion from? What is it that is your inspiration? What are you inspired by? The things that you do, where do you get the inspiration for them? You know why I'm asking these things? Because a lot of the time, we have listened to other people and we have formed or formulated some kind of mindset based on what we have heard from them. Not realizing 
that we have been subtly turned out of the way. And my mathematics friends tell me that if you miss the way by just as little as one degree, by the time you arrive at wherever you are arriving at, you'll be so far away from the mark, you won't even be able to recognize the mark. Just by one degree. Just by one degree off the mark. You know, a straight line, and you take one degree away from the straight line. And you continue, the straight line is moving in its own straight line, and you are moving in your new straight line. The further you go, the wider between the, the gap between the two of you. Where have you been spending your time? Where have you been spending your time? Who have you been listening to? What sentiments have you allowed to shape your opinion? Is it the sentiments echoed by the voices in this world? Or sentiments coming from the word of God? Or sentiments from your time in fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Who are you listening to? Now see, growing up as a young man, from time to time, we all have had nasty experiences. I mean, young man, 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 me, young man. Me and my guys, me and my fellows, who have, at one time or the other, have, have, have had nasty experiences with young girls. Either your girlfriend left you for a better boy or a more powerful boy or something like that. And you know what we arrived at? And we started to say, babies are witches, meaning girls are bad. Now, many of us entered marriage like that based on that opinion. Do you know how you are going to treat the person you are married to when you have that kind of mindset? Now, if, you, if, if I were to go back to my guys of that time and, and, and let's retrace how that thing came about, most of us would not be able to trace it to its origin. We just picked it up somewhere. Maybe beer parlor, or pub. So, some, we just picked it up. Don't you know that's how they are? That's what they do. They always go for the man that, that has more, more, more weapons. By weapons, I mean the things with which you can run after a woman. Now, that, that, that's the kind of sentiment. I'll just give you an example. That's the kind of sentiment we grew up with. The issue here is, who have you been listening to? That's the who has bewitched you question that the apostle asked in Galatians chapter 3. Who have you been listening to? Who have you allowed to shape your thinking? So my, my, my thinking, my, my teachers in geography, if I were living two, three, four hundred years ago, my teachers in geography told me that the world was flat. Is that true? Science has already proven that to be wrong. So my, my science teachers in geography taught me how rain is formed. Hot wind meets cold wind, dry wind meets wet wind, all those type of things. Now I can't really remember. This is about 40, 40 something years ago. Now, but the issue is this. I have since discovered, for example, from the Bible, that rain comes from heaven. That there's a body of water in heaven and there's a body of water on the earth, separated by the skies or the firmament, if you like. So for me, who is right and who is wrong? Now, in the last two years, talking about the, the, the last, uh, I'm not going to mention the name so Facebook doesn't shut me down. This thing the world has been shut down for in the past two, three years. People have been saying, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science, follow the science. So we've been following the science. What does the Bible say about following the science? It says some have made their faith shipwreck. Some have made their faith shipwreck by science so-called. That would be First Timothy chapter 6, I believe. Some have made their faith shipwreck by science so-called. Am I correlating with science? Not necessarily. Science has come up with very many beautiful things. But the issue is for Christians, who shapes your opinion? Science or the Word of God? Who have you been listening to? That's my grounds for today. Who has bewitched you? Now you see, some of the people who want to bewitch you, they will say to you, you cannot argue with results. You cannot argue with proofs. In other words, it's working for us. And if it's working for us, it must be God. Who told you that? Who told you that it is only when it is good that is God? Or who told you that because it is good, it is God? Who told you that it cannot be good and be what we call bad? Or is somebody dying on the cross a good thing? I mean, ordinarily, humanly speaking, of course not. 
Now we know God sent Jesus to the earth to die. God sent Jesus to the earth to do good, but the good that he did was to die. So God can send you somewhere and you get what we call a bad report. You can send you, oh, I, I need you to go over to that city. And you go over to that city and you get a very dirty slap. Does it mean that God didn't send you there? Does the slap validate or invalidate the word of God? Stop determining the validity of something by the experience that you get. Your experience does not validate the word of God. The word of God is the word of God. The word of God is validated by God himself. All you have to do is ask him. Or at least confirm from his word, the written one, at least. So who have you been listening to? Who has been pumping your ears and therefore your mind with ideas? Jesus said, take no thought, say, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, take no thought, say, if you take the thought, you are going to start speaking according to the thought. Take no thought, say, don't even accept the thought. That it appeared in your mind does not mean that it is yours. Any of a number of variables could have put it there. God, the devil, your neighbor, or even your own self. So I know my time is up. But who was Eve listening to? Big question. What's the name of that fellow who raped his sister? Absalom's brother. Amnon. Who was he listening to in raping his sister? How can your sister so... What's the word? How can you be so enthralled by your sister as to rape her? Obviously, he had been listening to his bizarre instincts. That's why I'm asking, who have you been listening to? So you ask him and he tell you, oh, the devil pushed me. Which devil? Where have you been spending time? Which opinions or what opinions have you been entertaining? Who have you been hanging with? You know, the Bible says, is Saul also among the prophets? Do you know how that question came about? It was because of a certain association. He found himself among, among prophets. And he began to prophesy. In other words, what or where or who you associate with can influence what you become. So where have you been spending time? In the presence of the Lord? Perhaps reading your Bible? Or in the presence of naysayers? Who had Eve been listening to? Yes, the flip side to that question will necessarily be Oga Adam. Where were you when your wife was being bewitched by questions, by suggestions? But like I said, my time is up. The issue today is simply this. You are entirely responsible for your outcome. Yes, the Holy Spirit will help. Yes, the Word of God is available. But the decisions are purely going to be yours, one way or another. But God says, I should tell you to return to him. Return to him. Return to spending time with him. Return to spending time with his written word. Return to spending time reading books from at least known men of God or books from people to which your spirit has quickened you. Return to things of the spirit. He says, I should tell you to return to him in Christ. Return to Christ. Return to Christ. Return to Christ. And turn your ears away from that to which you have given attention. Whatever it may be, you are playing with your faith. That is, if your heart has not already been turned. You are playing with fire. You are playing with the shipwrecking of your faith. Imagine if Paul, in Acts chapter 13, had not dealt with that sorcerer in the place 
of the deputy. That fellow would have successfully prevented the deputy from hearing the gospel. But like I said, I'm out of time. But we will continue this same time tomorrow. And I say to you in very clear and very strong terms, God said I should tell you to return to him. He said I should tell you to come back to him. In every possible dimension that that statement can mean, he said, come back to me. I am your great and exceeding reward. Come back to me. In me, everything that you are looking for out there has already been provided. He says, come back. Will you? I'll see you again same time tomorrow. Still on the subject of the state of the union. The union between Jesus and his bride, the church. God bless you. Until then, see you again.